Hello, this is Akram Jafar and in this video I'm going to present some picture tests and practical anatomy of the lower limb. This video is going to deal with the gluteal region and hamstring compartments. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Weakened flexion of the thigh and abduction at the hip and flexion of the leg at the knee would suggest an injury to this muscle or to the nerves innervating this muscle. Now let's identify the muscles first. Now muscle A is the gluteus maximus muscle and this is an extensor. It's a very powerful extensor of the hip. Although it abducts the hip, but it is a powerful extensor. It's not a flexor of the hip. And it doesn't flex the leg, actually. It keeps the knee in the extended position uh, through its action on the iliotibial tract. So it is not A. B, this is a hamstring muscle on the lateral side. And this is the biceps femoris muscle. And again, it, the hamstrings, they are extensors of the hip, not flexors. Um, this muscle does not do any abduction. It flexes the knee. Okay, it flexes the knee. But, and also uh, laterally rotates the flexed knee but it doesn't flex the hip, so it's not B. Now C, the muscle on the medial border of the femoral triangle, you can see the contents of the femoral triangle here. Here is the apex of the triangle. This muscle belongs to the adductor compartment, and it is the adductor longus muscle. As the name indicates, it's an adductor of the hip. It's not an abductor. And actually, the muscle is attached to the femur, so it doesn't reach the knee or distal to the knee so that to act on the knee joint. So again, it is not the muscle C, not the adductor longus. D is the long slender muscle on the front of the thigh that arises from the anterior superior leg spine. It is the sartorius muscle. It forms the lateral boundary of the femoral triangle, goes downwards and medially, and crosses the knee joint and is inserted into the upper part of the medial aspect of the tibia. The sartorius muscle, as its name indicates, the tailor's muscle, sartor means tailor, it uh, helps in attaining the tailor's cross leg position. And this implies flexion, abduction, and lateral rotation at the hip, as well as flexion at the knee joint. So this muscle can do the thigh abduction and flexion, as well as flexion of the leg and the knee joint. And injury of this muscle would result in weakness of these movements. The reason these movements are weakened, not lost, because there are some other muscles that can do the same job. Like we have hip abductors, we have other hip flexors, we have lateral rotators of the hip, and also we have many other flexors of the knee joint. Now the last muscle here is the rectus femoris muscle. The rectus femoris muscle causes flexion of the hip as it crosses the hip joint, the only member of the quadriceps that crosses the hip joint and causes extension of the knee. It doesn't cause flexion of the knee. It is the, together with the other members, the quadriceps femoris muscle is a very powerful extensor of the knee joint. So it flexes the hip, it doesn't abduct, and it doesn't flex the knee. So it's not the correct answer. Name the arterial anastomosis located at points A and B. This is the, a posterior view of the hip joint. You can see the ischial tuberosity here, sacrotuberous ligament, and this is the obturator foramen here. This is the head of the femur and the neck of the femur within the capsule of the hip joint. And you can see here that the capsule of the hip joint does not cover the entire posterior surface of the neck of the femur. It is short of the intertrochanteric crest, which extends between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. The arterial anastomosis is located at the level of the greater trochanter. It's called the trochanteric anastomosis and is formed by branches of superior and inferior gluteal artery and is also formed of an ascending branch from the lateral circumflex femoral artery and an ascending branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery. This arterial anastomosis is very important for the supply of the head of the femur since it sends the branches that pass with the reflection of the capsule of the hip joint called retinacular fibers and so these arteries are called retinacular arteries. The other anastomosis which is present at the level of the lesser trochanter is cruciate in shape and it is formed the cruciate anastomosis. It is formed by branch from the inferior gluteal artery 
descending branch, a transverse branch of the medial circumflex femoral artery, and a transverse branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery, and an ascending branch from the first perforator artery. The profunda femoris artery has four perforators, so the first perforator artery supplies an ascending branch and it creates a cruciate anastomosis at the level of the lesser trochanter of the femur. Which numbered area is safest to give an intramuscular injection? The gluteal region is a common place to give an intramuscular injection because of the presence of thick muscles here. And uh, at the same time, it should be taken into consideration that there is a neurovascular bundle located here. There is a big nerve, the biggest nerve in the body, which is the sciatic nerve, as well as other nerves like the superior inferior gluteal nerves, posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, nerve to uh, quadratus femoris, a pudendal nerve, and, and so on. In addition to the presence of arteries, superior and inferior gluteal artery here, you don't want to give the injection into these vessels and you don't want to give, give the injection into the, the very big sciatic nerve. So that's why you have to choose an area which is safe. The safest area here to avoid hitting the neurovascular bundle is to use the superior lateral quadrant. In order to identify the location of the superior, superior lateral quadrant, we have, first of all, to take into consideration that the gluteal region is not confined to the prominence of the buttock. It is a wide area that extends from the iliac crest above to the level of the gluteal skin folds, which is located at this location. So it's a, a very wide area. And uh, this gluteal skin fold, by the way, it doesn't correspond to the inferior border of gluteus maximus muscle. It's uh, due to attachment of the skin to the deep fascia and does not reflect the lower border of gluteus maximus muscle. So this is the first thing to keep into consideration. And then also we keep into consideration that the sciatic nerve, which we care much about, it leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic notch below pariformis, and it's located bit, almost midway between the ischial tuberosity located at this uh, region and the uh, posterior superior spine which is um, indicated by the skin dimple so it is somewhere here and then it leaves the gluteal region um, midway between the ischial tuberosity and the greater trochanter of the uh, of the femur so it is the, uh, this area should be avoided all these structures are palpable surface anatomical landmarks in fact the posterior superior spine is represented by the presence of a skin dimple sometimes we use a line extending between posterior superior spine and the greater trochanter and we give the injection above this line and sometimes we um, use the anterior superior spine you put you put the index finger on the anterior superior spine and then you try to spread the other fingers and then you give the injection uh, in the area that is located between the index finger and the uh, middle finger. In general, it is the superior lateral quadrant that is the safest, but again, I repeat that in order to locate this area, you have to keep into consideration that the gluteal region is a wide area. It is not confined to the prominence of the buttock because if you confine it to the prominence of the buttock, then the superior lateral quadrant is located here and definitely you are going to hit the sciatic nerve. The hip is a stable ball and socket joint, synovial joint with several strong supporting ligaments. Hip flexion exhibits a significant range of motion but hip extension is more limited. Which of the following hip ligaments is the strongest ligament and the one that limits hip extension? First of all, let's identify these ligaments. A is the ligament that extends from the ischium to the femur. It's the ischial femoral ligament. B is from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity. It's the sacrotuberous ligament. This ligament is in fact is not a ligament of the hip joint. This one is uh, considered as an extrinsic ligament that is important for the stability of the sacroiliac joint. Here, C is the iliofemoral ligament and extends from the anterior inferior iliac spine. Then it splits, like uh, the letter Y, to be inserted into the intertrochanteric line. This is the iliofemoral ligament. And then we have the pubofemoral ligament coming from the pubis. And uh, these pubofemoral ligaments and the issue of femoral ligament are not as strong as the iliofemoral ligament. The iliofemoral ligament is the strongest of these ligaments. It limits extension 
prevents hyperextension. The reason for that is the fact that the line of gravity in the body passes behind the hip joint and tends to extend the hip joint. So what prevents this uh, extension and tightens the, the ligament is the presence of a strong ligament in the front. This will prevent hyperextension of the hip joint. Extension of the hip joint tightens the oblique fibers of the pubofemoral and the ischiofemoral ligaments and pushes the head of the femur more into the acetabulum, thus increasing the stability of the hip joint. The fact that the ligament is brought into action, ligaments have less blood supply and they don't require much expenditure of energy like contracting the muscles. So it is more economic from the energy point of view to maintain the stability of this joint by mainly depending on ligaments. This trend is also seen in the knee joint. When the knee joint is locked during extension, it causes tightening of the ligaments of the knee, including the collaterals and the cruciate ligaments. And the knee becomes stable in extension without much use of muscle contraction. Name the ligament at the tip of the pointer, what passes through it. This is a coronal section of the hip joint. You can see the acetabulum here, note how deep the acetabulum is. This is the pelvis on this side, and this is the head of the femur. The ligament of the head of the femur arises from the acetabulum. It's attached to the transverse ligament that closes the acetabular notch. And on the other side, as you can see it here, it's attached to a pit or fovea on the head of the femur. You can see here the whitish cartilage, hyaline cartilage, on both surface of the head of the femur and the lunate surface of the acetabulum. Now what passes through this ligament, passing through it is a very small blood vessel, you cannot see it here, and this blood vessel is derived from the obturator artery. As the obturator artery passes here through the obturator foramen, leaves the pelvis through the obturator foramen to reach the medial compartment of the thigh. It gives a small artery that goes into the ligament of the head of the femur and participates in the blood supply of the head of the femur. This is a small contribution. The major contribution to the blood supply of the head of the femur comes from the trochanteric anastomosis through the neck of the femur. Which of the bony parts one to four is palpable? This is an Postural anterior view of the pelvis showing the hip joints and the proximal part of the femur. Let's identify the structures. A is the head of the femur, and the head of the femur, it fits into the acetabulum and is not palpable. Then two is the neck of the femur. The neck of the femur is in fact surrounded by a lot of muscles. It's very deep and is not palpable. Three is the lesser trochanter of the femur on the medial side. And again, it is so deep, as you can see here, the soft tissue shadows between the lesser trochanter and the skin, it's very deep. But the greater trochanter of the femur is more superficial, and actually it can be felt. It's one of the palpable surface anatomical landmarks on the lateral side of the hip, and it is the bone that annoys us when we sleep on our side on a hard surface. A hurdle runner avulsed the attachment of a muscle from her ischial tuberosity. Avulsion resulted from forcible flexion of the hip while the knee was extended. Which of the following muscles is likely avulsed? This is a, an avulsion fracture takes place at the site where the muscle in action is attached to bone. So it will cause fracture of bone and pull, it pulls the fragment of the bone away. And this is called avulsion fracture. So to the Ischial tuberosity, we have the muscles attached to the ischial tuberosity are the hamstring muscles, including the long head of biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus muscle. Let's look at the choices here. Gracilis is a muscle of the adductor compartment, and it's attached to the ischiopubic ramus, not to the ischial tuberosity. Sartorius is a muscle of the anterior compartment and is attached to the anterior superior iliac spine and might cause avulsion fracture of the anterior superior iliac spine. Rectus femoris is attached to the anterior inferior iliac spine and might cause avulsion fracture of this bony prominence, anterior inferior iliac spine. The adductor longus muscle is attached to the body of the 
pubic bone and is not attached to the ischial tuberosity and it's an adductor muscle. It's not brought into action during uh, forcible flexion of the hip while the knee is extended. So you can see here, this is uh, the opposite action of um, a muscle of the hamstring compartment. Muscles of the hamstring compartment, they flex the knee and they extend the hip when they contract. So this movement, extension of the knee and flexion of the hip means that the muscles are overstretched. So they will apply tension on the bone to which they are attached. And in this case, the muscle here, semimembranosus, is the um, muscle that might have pulled the um, ischial tuberosity. Same thing is true for the semitendinosus and long head of biceps femoris. A dipping of the pelvis during the stance phase of walking may occur if there is an injury to the nerves innervating which of the numbered muscles. This is uh, what we call positive Trendelenburg sign and it is produced because of the abductor muscles of the hip on the stance side cannot tilt the pelvis to clear the other foot of the ground. First of all, let's identify the muscles shown here. One is the gluteus medius muscle. It's attached to the greater trochanter and to the ilium, to the ala of the ilium. Second is the piriformis muscle. Piriformis is a lateral rotator. And it's also a weak abductor, but and lateral rotator and stabilizer of the hip joint. But the gluteus medius, as well as the gluteus minimus, both of them that are supplied by the superior gluteal nerves, they are attached to the greater trochanter and they are the abductors of the hip. But here, we're not only talking about abduction. Abduction of the hip is not the important function that is produced by these muscles. These muscles, when the femur is fixed on the stance side, they are going to act not on the femur, they are going to act on the pelvis. And so they will pull this side of the pelvis down, elevating the other side of the pelvis, tilting it up. So it's this muscle, paralysis of this muscle or injury of its nerve supply would result in dipping of the pelvis on the contralateral side. However, let's check the other muscles here. Uh, this is the quadratus femoris muscle, quadratus, not quadriceps, the quadriangular in shape, located posteriorly. As you can see it here, it's attached to the quadrate tubercle and the uh, ischium. And this muscle is a lateral rotator of the hip, the small muscle, not that much important, but important for the stability of the hip joint. Then we have the gluteus maximus muscle, number four, it has been cut from the sacrotuberous ligament and from the sacrum, part of the hip bone, and reflected. You can see the, the small, tiny, inferior gluteal nerve. Now this muscle, in fact, it's an abductor of the hip, an extensor of the hip, lateral rotator, but it does not do the action done by the gluteus medius and maximus in tilting the pelvis. Then we have the other muscle here. It's a muscle of the hamstring compartment going to the lateral side, arising from the ischial tuberosity. It's the long head of biceps. This muscle extends the hip joint and flexes the knee and it doesn't tilt the pelvis in the way that is described here. So the correct answer is one.